Hello, and welcome to this inaugural episode of Deep in Christ. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here at the Coming Home Network, and this is a conversation about the daily task of growing in imitation of and devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be discussing prayer, devotion, virtues, and much more, all with an eye towards practical implementation in our day-to-day lives. Today, I'll be joined by my good friend and colleague, Ken Hensley, to discuss the universal call to holiness that we all share as Christians, no matter our state in life, no matter our vocation, no matter where we are, who we are, we're called to be holy. Join us in a moment here on Deep in Christ. Well, hello and welcome to Deep in Christ. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here at the Coming Home Network, and this is a new program that we're excited to share with you. I'm excited that you're joining me for this, and um, and I hope that you get a lot out of it. We're we're starting this series of conversations about life in Christ, about the day-to-day journey, the day-to-day walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. And obviously, this is being produced by the Coming Home Network, and let me tell you first about the Coming Home Network and then why this fits in. But before I do that, I want to introduce my colleague and good (laughs) friend, Ken Hensley, uh, with the show to me today. Ken, how are you doing? Hi, John Mark. I'm doing well. (laughs) Thanks for- Good to be with you. Yeah, thanks for joining me for this. It's a real change, a little bit of a change of pace from the On the Journey show that I do with Matt Swain, so it's great. Yeah, we uh, here at the network, as well as people on YouTube, have been enjoying your show a lot. So we're excited to introduce this additional project to our lineup. Again, for those who may be listening and not know, or maybe who do know and need a little refresher, the Coming Home Network uh, is a network of people who have embraced full communion with the Catholic Church. Uh, My father started the Apostolate uh, over 25 years ago now, uh, and we assist others who are considering coming home to the Catholic Church. That's why we're here. That's what we do. We share stories. we, uh, we, We counsel we befriend, we walk with people who are thinking about making a similar journey, who are asking those questions. Um, and Ken, so Ken's involved with the, the apologetic side of the apostolate, so to speak, you know, working with people and their, their questions, and also his show, uh, tackling aspects of, of why being Catholic. Uh, Deep in Christ is going to be a show talking about that day-to-day journey of walking with Christ. And the, the reason that we're doing that here is that Again, while the the context here for the Coming Home Network is helping people consider becoming Catholic, the reasons why, whether that's that too is where God is calling them, you know, whether the church is who she says she is and who we believe she is, that each of us, at whatever stage of that journey we are, whatever state in life, whatever vocation, whatever our circumstances, we have the call to follow Christ um, today, and we have the grace to do that. And so, you know, People that you talk with, Ken, people that contact us, people that watch the various mm-hmm. shows or read the resources or participate in the community, even those that are very far from the church, even those who are not sure if they're ever going to become Catholic, they're just asking questions. We all want to encourage one, an- one another as brothers and sisters in Christ to not let up on that daily walk with Christ. Just wanted to mention, you know, the, the apologetics work that I do is, you know, is about thinking through theological issues, yeah. thinking about the reasons for becoming Catholic and all that. This is a subject, of course, that touches home in a different way because we are, every one of us, called to grow in holiness. And um, so this is something that we're pursuing every day of our lives, no matter what our, our, our vocation life. Right. Yeah. And again, it doesn't, we, we walk this balance here because on the one hand, we want to say in dialogue with, with fellow Christians and you know, and I'm I'm talking to you as a fellow Christian. If you're not Catholic and you're watching this, you know, we want to be able to say in those conversations a balance between. We maybe want to set aside the destination for a moment. Like I don't know if you're going to become Catholic. I believe the Catholic Church is who she says she is, but we can sort of theoretically we can set that aside for a moment and talk about the reasons. We can talk about Mary and the saints. We can talk about some of the apologetics issues. You know, and and. Just trust that, you know, if we're faithful to those things, we're faithful to that journey, and especially, again, in the context of this show, if we all are, remain faithful to the daily obligation to walk with Christ and go deeper in Christ, then he will work out that destination. He will lead us together. He will heal the church. You know, what needs to happen will happen. Mm-hmm. But the demands of today are to answer our questions, you know, and to continue uh, walking humbly with our God. 
so can you know with that context in mind of of the, you know, the coming home network and who our audience is you know you watching uh, we here uh, at, on staff what we're doing here as a network again this show fits in as a discussion alongside this question of becoming catholic alongside that we are talking about that the, this fact that we all have a continued uh, obligation to to walk with Christ and to go deeper in that relationship every day uh, and that uh, that are reaching the destination, the places that God's calling us to go, the things he's calling us to do, those are dependent on whether we're faithful to this obligation uh, today. So that's what we're talking about. Um, I just wanted to say something about the universal call to holiness, because this is something that's important in my life. Um, St. Jose Maria Escriva, who's the founder of, of Opus Dei, the, this was really the, the central um, insight that he had that, that launched the entire prelature of Opus Dei was simply that. Um, it seems that in Spain at the time, in the early, uh, you know, the early part of the 20th century, the, the atmosphere that was in the air sort of said this. It said, you know, look, if you if you really want to be holy, if you really want to lead a Christ-like life, you need to become a religious, mm -hmm. or you need to become a priest. Right. You know, and all the rest of you just get married and have kids and do your best. You know, show up for mass, something like that. You right. Know? Right. And so, his, his central insight was so simple. It was it, it was simply what you're saying. It was simply that no, God is calling every one of us. Um, to the highest levels of sanctity, um, if it could be to be to be canonizable saints, and um, this is something that's had a profound effect on me, because I used to be a pastor, and when I was a pastor, it sort of made sense that I was pursuing holiness, and then I found myself, you know, working other kinds of jobs to support my family when I left the ministry and all, and and so coming to this realization that, you know, that whether I'm standing behind a counter at Taco Bell or I'm I'm the guy giving out shoes at a bowling alley or, or, or whatever I'm doing. The call on my life is exactly the same as it is on um, any one of the saints that we read about. Absolutely. Yeah. And there could even, I could imagine that there could be at least the potential distraction, even for certain members, you know, in the network here, those that, that are thinking about becoming Catholic, those who are on that journey, um, again, to, to focus almost too much on that destination and, and let up on the gas pedal in terms of my day-to-day -day obligations. But that's that's part of what we want to keep this balance here is that we we do have the daily bread. We do have, you know, the grace that got that we need today uh, that God's giving us to be able to continue walking with him. And so we we need to lean into that. We need to to uh, to take advantage of that. I would say especially those that are on the journey need to be to, to remember that yeah. and to lean into it because when you're on the journey you can become I mean, toward the church, the people sure. who are on the journey toward the Catholic Church, they can become consumed with fears mm -hmm. of what their friends and family are thinking or going to react, or if they're ordained minister, you know, what am I going to do to make a living? And that's exactly the time when, in a sense, they need to pour it on, um, right. of building their life with Christ. Right. Absolutely. So with all that in mind, you know, our Lord commands us, you know, be you therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that scripture uh, precedes uh, a passage in Lumen Gentium, uh, which is a, and, uh, uh, one of the documents from Vatican II. The, I don't have the references here. What is it? What's, the, what's Lumen Gentium again? Uh, the Constitution of something. This is not good. On the church. Yeah, Constitution of the Church. That's right. So it, it's a really great document. You can look it up, Lumen Gentium. But uh, in paragraph 40 and onward, there's some really great crystallization, I think, of this topic as the Catholic Church sees it. And I think many Catholics probably haven't heard this language. Certainly many non-Catholics will not have heard this language, the Church talking about this call of every Christian uh, to pursue holiness, to walk with the Lord. And so I did want to begin us today um, looking at that passage. I'm going to read through some bits of it. And comment here and there, and then you know we're going to talk through some of the the highlights. But I, I think it, it it's a good place to start this whole discussion with, you know, uh, this bit of language that, that the church, you know, uh, again drawing from the years of tradition, drawing from the two thousand years of Christian living, the lives of the saints, the discernment of the church, um, talking about how this demand to be holy as our heavenly Father is is holy uh, rests on all of us. And rest on all of us in whatever state in life we are, whatever situation we are, whatever circumstances. That remains, you know, our daily task. And so I want to just read a little bit of that. So it begins, 
The Lord Jesus, the divine teacher and model of all perfection, preached holiness of life to each and every one of his disciples of every condition. He himself stands as the author and consummator of this holiness of life. And then there's the quote from Matthew, Be you therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And it goes on, Indeed, he sent the Holy Spirit upon all men that he might move them inwardly to love God with their whole heart and their whole soul, with all their mind and all their strength, and that they might love each other as Christ loves them. And there's lots of scriptures embedded in this text. I'm not going to necessarily cite each of them as we go. But, you know, in this first bit of this passage from Lumen Gentium, again, uh, Christ calls everyone. And of course, we, we didn't even talk so far yet in our discussion, Ken, about um, this call to holiness extends even beyond our uh, the, the bounds of our Christian family, of our brothers and sisters, uh, certainly not just in the Catholic Church or even our uh, other Christians that we're in imperfect communion with. But this demand is also placed on all human beings. You know, whether they f- know it fully consciously or not, we're all called to be good, to be holy, to walk with God. Mm-hmm. Um, we who know that more consciously because we've received the gospel, we're blessed to have received the gospel. You know, we perhaps have a higher demand placed on us, higher responsibility, higher culpability if we don't follow that. But that call is extended to everyone. That's the purpose for which humans were created. And everyone is called, uh, to that perfection, to that holiness. You just sort of hit on the, the, uh, the key issue uh, because it's about our, it's about what is what we're called to by creation when right. you use the word creation that's exactly it you know the scriptures teach us that we are we were we were created in the image and likeness of god yeah. and whatever that means trying to dig into you know the sure. you know the details of it we were created to be finite mirrors of of god yeah. um in terms of how we live in terms of our moral life in terms of how we think we were, we were created to think god's thoughts after him and to live a life of holiness that that um that is in God, right? And so, and so that applies to everyone in the universe. That applies yeah. to every person that's ever been created, right? And it also apply, you know, another thing that applies is that all have sinned and fallen short of the, the glory of God, mm-hmm. and that includes all of us here. Even we who consciously have received the gospel, we know what we need to do. We're not doing it as well as we ought to be. You know, we're we have not yet, um, mm-hmm. and we we won't in this life ever be done. You know, turning this that's what conversion means turning to Christ, well, and that's why, yeah. and that's why salvation is about being forgiven for that. Like you said, all have sinned and fallen short, and then being remolded into the image in which we were created. Um, kind of a you know, you know, as they say, all illustrations limp or all analogies limp. The kind of a an illustration that I've used in the past is that is that I was created to be a mirror of God's character and being. And because of the fall, I've become more like a funhouse mirror. You know, where you, you stand in front of that mirror, <laughs> right. and it, and you know, it looks like Ken. You can still see Ken, but it's like all it's all wrong. You know, it's all distorted and stretched out or smashed down. It's all out of shape. In a sense, uh, you know, every time we look into the mirror, you know, we are seeing the image of God. But it's just not. But it's the image of God distorted um, by the fall and di- dis- distorted by sin. And so. So we can think of the whole work of salvation as being about forgiving us for our sins and then transforming us back into the image in which we were created. Not some other image, but the image in which we were originally created. Right. And since that applies to everyone, even beyond, you know, those who have have been baptized into the church, who have, you know, become sacramentally members of the body of Christ, that's why we evangelize. Because again, they too, we, we can't presume either on their invincible ignorance nor on their, uh, mm-hmm. no, nor can we know that they are, you know, where their heart is in relationship to God. We we can't know, so we we have to, you know, assume that they like us need conversion, and so we preach the gospel to them. Right. I'm going to go on with the right. this passage from Lumen Gentium. It goes on: the followers of Christ are called by God, not because of their works, but according to His own purpose and grace. They are justified in the Lord Jesus because in the baptism of faith. They truly become sons of God and sharers in the divine nature. In this way, they are really made holy. And uh, two quick points there. I mean, one, again, we were uh, was just talking before this about um, how this points to our need to evangelize. We need to share the gospel with the rest of the world because we all need conversion. But again, this brings it back to, but it begins with us. We can't give what we don't have. You know, we first have to be submitted Mm -hmm. to Christ. We first have to be turning, converting, 
you know, asking for mercy, seeking God's grace first, um, and then we turn uh, outward and, and share that with Him. The the passage I just read is also interesting because it does clarify a little bit of precisely what the Catholics are talking about here in terms of holiness and justification. You know, it we're, we're this is not something we do on our own, is it? Yeah, that phrase caught my my ear. You know, where it said "not of works." You know, it's 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 not what Saint Paul's talking about in Galatians and Romans when in "not of works." It's not about earning things from God or anything like that. Um, holiness is not that. Again, it's being. I think that in that little passage you just read, it said "not of works," but it said through baptism, it mentioned grace and it mentioned being remolded into the image of Christ. So we're talking about completely a work of grace being brought back to the image in which we were created. And you know what, what helps me, since God can seem, you know, God can seem out there and at an abstract, to put a face on it is to there's another passage of scripture that jumps out at me. It's Hebrews chapter one, verse three, which says that, well, it, it's saying that God had spoken in times past through the prophets in many different ways. And now he's spoken to us in his son. And then it's the next phrase in the in the translation that I knew so well and had memorized sections of the Bible in, it said this, um, that he's spoken to us in his son, who is the radiance of his glory, of God's glory, and the exact representation of his nature. And so, you know, to put a clear face on it, being remolded back into the image in which we were created is being remolded into the image of Christ. It's becoming like him. And that's why Paul, in so many different ways in his letters, can say things like, put off your old nature, and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And he can say, be imitators of Christ and, um, and, and so forth. So, I mean, that's the goal. And it's, and it's, as you said, it's by grace. It's not something you're working and earning. It's something that, that um, well, you know, we need God's forgiveness and grace every second to do it. But that's the path. Right. And it's an important place to start, you know, this, dis- or, you know, to include in this discussion, but also in the larger discussion of this show in the context of the Coming Home Network, because again, many uh, members of the network, you know, are, are non-Catholic Christians of denominations where there's a lot of suspicion about Catholics and works and stuff that gets mm-hmm. in the way. Uh, and we, you know, we want to, we're on the same page here in the beginning. It's all by grace. It all comes by grace. Now, God has chosen to work through also our actions. He calls us to cooperate. He calls us to say yes, Mm -hmm. you know, and he works through our yes. He works through our actions. He, um, Mm -hmm. that, that's the way that he's chosen to work this out is that we cooperate and he works through us, but it all comes from grace. Um, but it's necessary to start there because a lot of the discussions going forth are then going to be sharing on the show are going to be sharing uh, how the church has understood many aspects of this life in Christ. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking about prayer. We're going to be talking about uh, Catholic devotions. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking about the, the virtues is a big topic for me and lots of other things. But always remember that, that again, we if, if there's a concern out there, we agree this is all a work of grace. And this is simply um, our call as Christians to cooperate with that grace. Yeah. And, and I guess I just want to say to anybody listening to this that would want to go more deeply into the, the theology of it, and the other show that I do um, on the journey, on the journey with Matt and Ken, we're actually deep in a series on sola fide, that justification by faith alone. And um, in those episodes, we're talking in detail about works and what Paul meant by works and what the difference is between works and uh, the obedience of faith and all that. But for our purposes here, just to state clearly that we're not talking about something that we earn or anything like that. Um, you know, you can put all that completely out of your mind, and the Bible verses are still there. I think of Hebrews chapter 12, where, where the author says that we must pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The call to holiness is still there, um, but a passage again that I would want to throw out is, is Philippians 3, 12 and 13, where Paul says, work out your own salvation. You were just saying, John Mark, about how we're involved, you know? Work out your own salvation. Well, that sounds like works. Work out your own salvation, he says, with fear and trembling. Well, that sounds like super duper works, right? I mean, with fear and trembling, I'm working out my salvation. But then the very next phrase is, because God is at work in you, both to will and to do. And so it's all God's grace working in us. And when you when you said that God uses our actions, what popped into my mind, I guess just one of the most perfect illustrations is the blind man who who comes to Jesus 
And Jesus doesn't just heal him. Jesus says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He has to do something. He has to trust Christ's word. He has to have faith. And then he has to do something. And his doing doesn't earn his, his, his eyesight or anything right, like right. that. It, that's completely in another world from the, from the way Scripture is thinking. But he has to do it. And it's when he washes in the pool of Siloam, he comes up seeing. And it's just such a beautiful illustration of how God includes us in, in the process. Because right, he wants to remake, as you said earlier, remake, remold us. This is not about yeah. checking off boxes. This is about allowing God, <clears throat> cooperating with God's transforming us. As it's, again, that passage from Lumen Gentium saying, because in baptism of faith, they truly become sons of God and sharers in the divine nature. In this way, they are really made holy. That's what God wants to do in us. So I'm, I'm going to go on from yes, there, yes. Um, because then the next passage uh, from Lumen Gentium, mm -hmm. um, and again, this is shot full with scriptures. If you look this up, if you look up Lumen Gentium, it'll come up on the Vatican website. You read that bit uh, of the document, you you can see all the references in the references there. This is heavily steeped in scripture. That's where the church is drawing from. Um, but I'm not going to cite them as we go through. I'm just going to read through it. But this is now getting into, again, what that looks like as we work that out in our life. It goes on, then too, by God's gift, they must hold on to and complete in their lives this holiness they have received. They are warned by the apostle to live as becomes saints and to put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, a heart of mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and to possess the, the fruit of the Spirit in holiness. Since truly we all offend in many things, we all need God's mercies continually, and we all must daily pray, forgive us our debts. So holding on and completing this gift that was given to us. Again, it all comes to us by grace, but God works through us. Our decisions, our yeses, our working out the salvation in fear and trembling, to complete what was made in us. Amen. And, you, you know, uh, I'm thinking, as you're reading that passage, and I'm thinking about this, um, this principle of the spiritual life really is a principle that we can see reflected in all of life, uh, which, again, takes us back to creation. Um, it's all one. It, it seems to me that, that, that the fabric is all one. Um, j just like in, cre in the created realm, you know, I want to grow some, I'm a farmer and I want to grow some things. And I know that only God can make thing, things grow. But I also know that unless I go and plow this field and I, you know, I dig some holes and I throw some seeds into the ground and I cover them over and I fertilize and water and I take care of it and I, you know, I, you know keep the bugs away and the crows or whatnot, nothing will grow. So I'm, I'm totally involved. And yet when the corn comes up out of the ground or whatever, I say, thank you, Lord, you know, for, for your gift. And, and so, it, it, you know, that's an illustration. And the, the thing that's interesting is I'm taking this illustration from Martin Luther, uh, you know, the, the, the founder of the Reformation, if you will. These are illustrations that Martin Luther gave. And another one was procreation, about how that God creates human souls. I mean, God, I mean, heck, the, the highest point of God's creation is human beings made in the image and likeness of God. And God creates them, and yet he... He chooses to create them through the actions and lives of human beings. And, and anyway, so it's not like this is the way it is in the natural realm. And then when, you get, then when you get to the supernatural realm or to spirituality, then suddenly all of that is junked. And now, and, and now we just sit there and God just does it or something. You know, we are just as involved. You know, I think many, many saints have said things like that we should work, that is on, on holiness in our lives, that we should work as though it as though it were entirely up to us, and we should pray as though it were entirely up to God. Yeah, I think that was Augustine who said that at one point. Yeah. Okay. Well, he said things that were pretty good from time to time. There wasn't a while, you know. <laughs> anyway, you know, these are exciting thoughts, though, because this is the goal of our life. This is the main thing. And that's why I do want to repeat what you've said several times, that when we're talking to people who are Catholics, we're talking to some people that are on the journey to one degree. Um, to becoming Catholic, we're, we're talking to some people who are maybe just barely curious about Catholicism, and maybe we're talking to some people who are evangelicals who have no interest in Catholicism at this point. But this is something we have in common. We all know, we all know that Christ is calling us to grow spiritually, to get closer to him, and to become more and more like him. Yeah. And this, you know, there's also... Like the, those words you said, to live his life, to put on, put on Christ, you know, to possess, all, all, all of that. Right. 
you know, this also points to, again, the, the sacramental aspect of the Catholic Church, which, again, some people might be unfamiliar with, they may be suspicious of, you know, but as you said, it's the same principle in nature as in the spiritual life that, you know, we can't earn or create any of this. We can only receive what God's given us. And if he's mm-hmm. given to us that, hey, the way new kids come in the world is by the the, the marital act, you know, and the way that uh, that he, he grows and nourishes us is through food and drink that we receive. Well, so too, if if the way that he has chosen uh, to to bring us forward in the spiritual life, to remake us, to make us into sons and daughters of God, truly uh, involve our efforts, our will, our yes, and also involve the, the church, and also involve these sacraments, baptism, yes. the Eucharist, you know, reconciliation. Again, right here on this on this show, we're not getting into the apologetics of those. Those will be over on, on Ken's show definitely check out on the journey. It's a great show. The point is here is maybe just consider, especially if it's very foreign to you, consider that that's all we're saying here, that if God has given us those things, if he has chosen to work through those things, then we as Christians need to say, yes, Lord. Right? Yeah. And, and you know, I I can't keep from sl- sliding in a, a touch of sure, apologetics sure, here and there. I'm, I'm thinking about some of the more radical wings of Protestantism after the Reformation that wanted to go in and smash all statues and throw them out, throw the altar out, throw crucifixes out, smash, you know, the uh, stained glass windows. And some of them went so far, and some of them are still there, really, of of thinking no art of any kind, you know, nothing like that, because that's all carnal. And, uh, you know, the the basic idea is that, that somehow the true worship of God is purely mental or purely spiritual. And, um, and therefore, if we can keep it to reading the Bible and preaching sermons and singing songs, uh, sing, singing hymns to God and praying, then it's pure. And, you know, one of the things that happened to me as I was on the road toward Catholicism, that were really basic things, was I remember sitting there and, and thinking, can you imagine sitting on a beach, let's say, and looking out over, a, well, you have to be on the West Coast for this, but a beautiful sunset over the ocean. Can you imagine looking out and being moved by that sunset and then someone saying, stop it. That's totally carnal. Your worship of God needs to be purely spiritual. You should not be thanking God for the beauty of the sunset. You know, you know, like you said, in, in the natural world, we eat food and we drink. I mean, we are, we are physical beings in this world. And so when you think of it, the idea that God would use that physicality or use the physical world as means of grace is not a strange idea at all, although it's very, very foreign to, to the kind of Christianity that that thinks of that as, as carnal. And that's really all we're saying as Catholics. I mean, we won't go into it, but when we talk about sacraments, we're just saying there are some physical things in the world, actions and things, you know, that God has chosen to use as a means to communicate his grace to us. Right. Really beautiful. Yeah. So in that passage, the last one that I read, again, uh, the, the exhortation, uh, and again, this is all from scripture, is to, is to hold on and to complete and to pursue. I mean, these are all scriptural exhortations uh, that we co- we are to continue cooperating with God and letting Him remake in us, you know, uh, the, His virtues, His, His goodness. We're, we're to walk in imitation of Him. Let me read the the final bit of that, uh, at least the quote that I pulled out from Lumen Gentium. It goes, "Thus it is evident to everyone that all the faithful of Christ, of whatever rank or status, are called to the fullness of the Christian life and to the perfection of charity." By this holiness as such, a more human manner of living is promoted in this earthly society. In order that the faithful may reach this perfection, they must use their strength accordingly as they have received it, as a gift from Christ. They must follow in his footsteps and conform themselves to his image, seeking the will of the Father in all things. They must devote themselves with all their being to the glory of God and the service of their neighbor. In this way, the holiness of the people of God will grow into an abundant harvest of good as is admirably, admirably shown by the life of so many saints in church history. A couple of things that jump out to me in this, again, another beautiful passage, the, the church speaking from this 2,000-year history, speaking uh, about life in Christ, um, it, it does all come back to Christ. It comes back to the imitation of Christ. You know, again, we were just talking about this, this proposition that maybe seemed foreign to some, that God works through the physical world, but again, if we, even if we just simply look at the, the imitation of Christ, if we simply look at Christ's example, he became man. 
he had a mother. <laughs> he ate food. He drank mm -hmm. drink. He had friends. You know, um, it, he showed us that this life is not some ethereal spiritual thing. No, it is it is walking mm -hmm. with God as human beings. But he did it first. He gave us that example. And so, um, you know, we'll talk on the show a lot about different aspects of that. Again, the prayer, the devotion, virtue, stuff like that. But we see it most clearly instantiated in Christ's example. Yeah, and then when he called disciples, he said, follow me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, or or when they said, uh, you know, I don't remember the line now, but when they said, hey, teacher, what's going on? You know, he said, come and see, okay? So, yeah, he he he's incarnated in in human life, in human form as a man, and he lives a human life, and then he calls us to follow. So yes, it's all about the imitation, and that's that's stated in so many different different ways throughout Scripture. Right. So I, I want to begin our wrap up a little bit, you know. But going back to the beginning of okay. that passage I just read, there's this line that we we've often pulled out and and referenced in the context of the Coming Home Network, and it is that that Christians are called to the fullness of the Christian life and to the perfection of charity. You know that gets a little bit at the reason that the Coming Home Network exists, but also it, it gets at the, the balance we try to strike between, on the one hand, our mission is to proclaim the truth and beauty of the Catholic Church, to mm -hmm. share that, to encourage people, to answer their questions, to help people um, come to, again, what we believe is the fullness of the Christian life. Um, but we do that because, again, of this underlying call that we've all received as Christians, and indeed as human beings, which is to seek the perfection of the Father to be remade in him, to receive his mercy, to receive his grace. You know, if there is a, I mean, again, this is, this is the proposal out there, especially to, to non-Catholic Christians who maybe are, are listening in or considering the Catholic Church, just the proposal that if there is more, if there is a greater fullness that Christ wants to give any of us, mm -hmm. then we should want that. And, and again, that's the reason the Coming Home Network is here, is to propose that, that there perhaps is more. Um, but it all comes back to this, this obligation, this demand, this call to be holy and to walk with our Lord. Yes, and um, if I could kind of state it in the opposite direction, um, as a convert now, who, um, you know, I was an evangelical Protestant for about 20 years, and I've been a Catholic now for 23, I would say that the passage from the Catechism that I share the most often with people who come to, to us and have questions and are on the journey to one degree or another um, is that passage that talks about the Reformation, and I, I'm just paraphrasing now, but it says, it says basically that that at the time of the Reformation there was there were many things that happened, and there was definitely sin on both sides. Okay, it says that, and then it goes on to say, but but we do not charge with the sin of the separation that occurred in the 16th century. We do not charge those who are born now into these separated Christian communities, all the evangelical churches, all you know, all the churches. We do not charge them with the sin of the separation, and it, and it says we receive them with affection and respect as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then the, our, our, our catechism goes on to say that the Holy Spirit uses these churches as means of grace. They have the Bible, they have faith in Christ, they have many, many um, uh, you know, uh, signs and means of grace there. And so this is something that's really important to me. Um, because because I know that during the 20 years that I was an evangelical, I know that I knew Christ then. I, I know that I had a, a living relationship with the living Lord, and I was trying to pursue the Lord and grow in the Lord. And so the idea that, that I wasn't even a Christian somehow until I became a Catholic is, is something that doesn't stand a moment's thought in my mind. Um, so we are all the same in that sense that we have Christ, we have the Word of God. And I'm speaking to my evangelical, to our evangelical friends here. Um, we have the Word of God, we have Christ, we have the call to holiness. And yes, it's true that as a Catholic, I, I do believe what you just said, that, that, that there is more to, you know, that, that Christ did establish a church, and in this church is the fullness of everything that he has for us. But that puts us on a continuum more, more than an either-or. Right. You know, it's interesting, too, I, you just reminded me that um, in telling a bit of, of your own background, I, I didn't really introduce much myself much in the beginning, you know, my place in the context of the Coming Home Network here, I'm, I'm a, the child of parents, evangelical Christian parents, um, 
who came home to the Catholic Church. My father, Marcus, started this apostolate you know, over 25 years ago because he was a pastor, Presbyterian pastor, who, you know, through his walk with Christ, through his commitment to Christ, you know, found, uh, discovered, suspected that there was more and followed that home to the church. And so I'm here because of his witness, but also because of the witness of so many Christians, those inside the church and out, see their their commitment to Christ, mm-hmm. you know, the change that he's made in their lives, that I too uh, want to live the fullness that I've been given by my parents and by, the, you know, the the Christians in my life, but also to share that fullness uh, with other Christians. And so that's why I, even though I, I came into the church when I was five with my, with my family, I remain passionate about this work, about this, about this, uh, this apostolate of helping sharing the truth of the Catholic church, but also, of course, more importantly and foundationally, well, not necessarily more importantly, foundationally, this topic of our daily walk with Christ, our daily conversion deeper into Christ. So, but John yeah. Mark, I don't think you should be so humble. You should at least <laughs> you should at least tell them that you you may have been five years sure. old, but your conversion was because you read through a Saint Thomas's Summa in the Latin. Yeah, yeah. When I was four and a half, five volumes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I want to end by you know uh, uh, we've we've pivoted already naturally to this a little bit, but to to state it a bit more more um, fully here that. Again, in the context of the Coming Home Network, we're trying to strike an authentic ecumenical balance. You know, on the one hand, our mission is to share the truth and beauty of the Catholic Church, but also, on the other hand, to continue to affirm people in their their baptism, in their walk with Christ, and to call mm-hmm. all of us to continue to, to not let up on that walk, even though we're having these discussions, even though people are asking questions, considering becoming Catholic, mm-hmm. we each of us have to walk with Christ more each day. And I want to share this this neat quote. This was from... Uh, the Coming Home Network did a series of deep and history conferences a while back, and the late, great um, Father Benedict Groeschel gave a talk at one of those conferences. And I don't even remember what the context of this was, but um, in a talk, he gave this quote that I, I wrote down and saved, and I've referred to it many times over the years. Um, but he wrote this, The real foundation of a real ecumenism is devotion to Jesus Christ. Devotion is a powerful personal conviction that our divine Savior in eternal life knows me, knows you individually, knows us, not as the great choir, but one at a time, that he cares about us, that he sends us grace, that in the difficult times of life we can trust him, and that he will lead us even through the valley of the shadow of death, that he expects things of us, and that when we fail he expects our repentance, that he hears our prayers, especially for those who are dear to us and for the world, and that in the hour of death, when we close our eyes, we will find him. He will be there. So I love that quote because, again, that's what we're called to, this devotion to Christ. And that it's, it's on the basis of the degree to which we are faithful to that, we can be open to you know, the, the authentic ecumenism, the, the healing of the body of Christ, the drawing people home, the, you know, the, the, the healing of wounds, the, the bringing together of uh, of disagreements and, and ruptures in the body of Christ, that depends on how well each of us um, are devoted to Christ and, and walk in that that state. Yeah, amen. And I'd, I'd like to close, I guess, my statement by reading a quotation in front of me here from John Mark Grodi that says, Despite the brokenness of Christianity, we are baptized brothers and sisters, all sharing the call to holiness in Christ. Only to the degree that we follow Christ will he work through us to bring about reunion and healing. Oh, thanks, Ken. <laughs> That's a great statement. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Even, I mean, even though you said it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, nothing that I say, of course, as the same for both of us, we're drawing from those who've come before us, those things we've read and, and listened to. But hey, I really appreciate you joining me for this, Ken, and for this discussion, this kickoff to this new project, this show. It was good to be with you. It was great. Yeah, And thank you if you're listening in or watching this, this new program. Again, I thank you for joining us. Um, again, Deep in Christ is the name of this program. We're going to be talking about all aspects of that. Ken's going to join me once more next week, and we're going to, to dive a little bit deeper into the kinds of things we're going to discuss in the show. There's a neat a section of the Catechism that talks about the different aspects of life in Christ. We're going to work through those, study them a little bit, and so we hope you'll join us for that. Um, if you yourself are uh, thinking about becoming Catholic, if you're, if you're not a Catholic, um, we want to hear from you, you know, or even if you're a new member of the church, or even, you know, if you're a long, 
a lifelong Catholic uh, who's uh, living your faith out. We hope that you'll continue to join us uh, for this program discussing life in Christ. But go to www.chnetwork.org to learn more about the Coming Home Network. We've got a lot of great programming there, a lot of great um, resources. Uh, we have an online community and a newsletter You know, for, for uh, members of the network you should check out. We also have, again, other great shows like Ken's uh, show on the journey that he does with Matt Swaim, our manager of outreach. And so check that out and, uh, you know, become a member, uh, stick around. And again, if you if you like this and you're listening to this on YouTube or, or podcast, be sure to follow or like your all, all the usual internet stuff. So thank you. And we'll talk again next week. God bless.